children a loving home. Every child deserves the opportunity to live with a loving family, a family who will nurture and support them into adulthood and beyond. By adopting, you can help change a child's life and your own. Contact Tower Hamlets today to find out more about how you could adopt. Leica Mobile is giving you a fantastic offer to call Bangladesh when you buy the national bundle. Get 500 minutes, unlimited text to any UK network, unlimited Leica Mobile to Leica Mobile calls and unlimited internet for just £10. Plus, call Bangladesh landlines for 1p per minute and mobiles for 3p per minute. So, what are you waiting for? To buy the bundle, dial the code on the screen. For more information and your free Leica Mobile SIM, visit leicamobile.co.uk today. Terms and conditions apply. Leica Mobile. Call the world for less. Anyone who claims women are the weaker sex obviously isn't familiar with the challenging and often grueling history of women's struggles that has existed for many years. But where did this struggle begin and what exactly have we been struggling for? And the big question, has it been successful? Join us for this discussion and more in today's Women's AM. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum and welcome to another jam-packed episode of Women's AM. But packed with what I hear you ask? Well, we're going to be discussing all things concerned with women and we kick off the show with features and news articles. Then in her views we turn our attention to the struggle of women throughout history. And final, in a, finally in our third segment of the morning we'll be discussing a famous hadith and its relevance in today's society. As always there's so much to get through so let's meet the sisters on the panel today. We have our Women's AM regulars, Sister as Nazia and Aisha. Assalamu alaikum, ladies. And we are very blessed today to have our special guest sister, Tasneem Nazir, joining us this morning, who is a journalist and author, and of course, mother of three, mashallah. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about you uh, and what you do later on in the show, inshallah. Uh, thanks. So, sisters, how's everybody this morning? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, feeling good, feeling ready for the discussion? Yes. Inshallah. Well, Moving away from things we feel good about, this morning I want to ask you about something that you feel bad about. Has anybody got any phobias? Nazi, I'm going to ask you first. Um, it's more a fear of heights, but it's not so... It's, I just find it very... It depends on the context. So I yeah. remember once being on holiday and I had to go on a cable car ride. And that, that was just so traumatic. I was like, I need to sit on that particular side because just to see the view across, yeah. we were looking down quite a height. At, um, mountains and oh it's just very difficult for me to watch that yeah and sometimes those cable cars can be a little yeah, bit you know, you're not sure they're the safest thing <laughs> to be yes. in <laughs> fantastic view though mashallah yeah. when you get out there <laughs> um sister tesney what about you well i'm scared of alsatian dogs i've always had this fear really yes yeah. since i was a child you know because i was chased one day in oh, the park no. by an alsatian dog oh. so i've always had that kind of fear but um you know um it, some dogs are very very they cute, can be very but yeah, very cute. Yeah. But yeah, some yeah. can be very cute, but some can be very but frightening. That, yeah. It didn't catch you, I hope. Um, no, it just kind of hit onto my leg, and I was oh. like, oh god. So, oh, <laughs> oh, alhamdulillah, you know, now as you get older, you know, the, the phobia kind of dies down. Yeah, yeah. Sister yeah. <laughs> um, so Aisha, what about you? Um, I don't have a phobia. You're fearless. I, I'm not fearless. <laughs> I wouldn't say, but uh, no, alhamdulillah, I, I, you know, alhamdulillah, I don't have a phobia, but I have lots of pet peeves. Oh, and you know right. it's it's just so many I can't explain it all at the okay. moment it's just uh, that's what I have but that's yeah, uh, another um, show maybe, another yeah. show yeah another discussion well you know uh, for me I have a very specific uh, phobia mine is stag beetles <laughs> Um, and again, similarly to you, linked to a very specific incident from my childhood where I was attacked en masse by oh, stag beetles in an alleyway oh, near gosh. where I lived and it was a horrific, horrific experience and wow. since then, well, let's say it scarred me for life. Oh, <laughs> but you look good now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jazakallah, hair sisters, really interesting insight into you all there. Uh, let's move on to our first segment of today now with News Bites. Mm -hmm. 
In this segment, the sisters take us through a selection of features and articles that have caught their attention this morning. So, sisters, what have you got for us this morning? Nazi, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I've got an interesting collection for you. Um, the first one's taken from The Telegraph. Um, concern over sexualization of girls and bad language to alter film ratings. So the British Board of Film Classification are going to change their guidelines regarding the classification of movies. And this is based upon a survey they, they did where they, um, it was 10,000 people that were involved of di different people from different walks of life, different age ranges, right. and they were basically asking them what they felt about the current uh, classifications yeah. and just the whole um, uh, movies industries, I guess. Um, mothers of girls um, were found to be particularly sensitive, sensitive um, to the increasing sexual and sexualized culture that their daughters were growing up in. With the music industry, obviously, they were looking at the whole issue of sexualized, um, you know, the sexualizing of girls. And one yeah. of the things that kind of jumped out from the article was the fact that a lot of these things are almost being pushed to be like normalized yeah, and that absolutely. was their concern that this it shouldn't you know it's almost giving when you have so much of it happening that it just normalizes the situation and yeah. they're not happy with it but I think the thing that interested me about this was when they were looking at the classifications the ones that caused a lot of discussion was 12a and 15 right. where they felt that a lot of the films didn't match um, like it, despite the fact that the recommended ages, they felt the content wasn't suitable. Yeah. And for me, I was just thinking that actually there's two issues here. It's good that they've raised it, but there's also this factor that, well, I think it doesn't look at the root of the problem. Yeah. Why is it the women are depicted in the way that they are depicted in the first place? Is classification going to root out that problem? It's not, because I understand the points that they're making that people have more access to movies through Netflix, iPad, and all those issues. So. It needs to go further into yeah. the whole root of the problem, which is why? Why yeah. do we have this culture? Why is it acceptable? Um, the second article um, is taken from, uh, it's basically taken from The Guardian, Downton Bill, Women Rights, um, Eliza Campbell. So Eliza Campbell is campaigning against um, the end of male uh, primary primogeniture, which basically essentially what it means is that men are still inheriting the bulk of the inheritance in the aristocracy. Now, I think regardless of what social class we're looking at, often, you know, when it's kind of depicted or there's certain things that have been, uh, you know, inheritance is something that's been resolved. This is clearly not the case across the board. You have yeah. certain social classes where there, it's still an issue. Yeah. Now, this, this particular woman is talking about the fact that she's the daughter of an earl yeah. and she doesn't have any brothers, but the bulk of uh, the estate, everything, is going to go to the nearest um, kin, who is an eighth cousin. And he's mm. the he's the next male basically. Wow, well, that must so be it's, really difficult. It's difficult, to do exactly. With, yeah. So from her point of view, it's like, well, this is a discrimination. You know, yeah, she absolutely. feels that women are yeah. still subjugated. The fact yeah. that she cannot inherit, um, uh, which should be quite rightly her right to do so. I mean, you know, when you look at it from the Islamic point of view, my understanding of inheritance is the fact that it goes down before it can go absolutely. across. So yeah. even if there are no male heirs, the fact is that the the daughters will inherit. Yeah. Yes. And even if there are male heirs, there are still the those portions for the daughters. So yeah. For me, it just flagged up the issue that there's clearly, I mean, when I read this, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, the, the Downton Bill itself is named after that program, um, Downton, Downton Abbey, Abbey, because this, the story, as I mentioned, begins with the issue of the same scenario as an earl who has daughters, no male heirs. Um, mm -hmm. But it's so striking, the period that it's set is in, end of 19th century, which is the same as the Bennett period when you yes. go even further back. So yeah. nothing has changed. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, till now. No, absolutely. And very relevant to what we're going to be talking about later on, inshallah. Yeah. Um, Sister Naz uh, Nazmi, what's your um, thoughts on this? Well, I think um, in the pre-Islamic period, they gave... Um, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu gave the rights of inheritance to the woman and there was, there was many rights given um, in terms of property inheritance and in terms of um, giving the woman their kind of liberation and yeah. to have yeah. um, you know, to have their, their rights that they were entitled to, which yeah. wasn't even um, established within the Victorian times, even when, when you look at it, there was still that kind of gap mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the rights that were given to them. So I think in, in that respect, the fact that it's still kind of continuing going on today. and continuing yeah. today. And See, that's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, over 1400 years ago, Islamically, this was a right that, you know, was afforded to women. And yet, you know, as you said, we can look through, uh, you know, certainly British history, and we can mm -hmm. see that this is something that's still 
felt an issue today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very uh, stark contrast there. And uh, as I said, I'm sure we'll go more into that later on, inshallah. Um, Aisha, what have you got for us this morning? I've picked out very interesting medical-related um, issues uh, okay. here as my topics. But the first one is in the Daily Mail. Um, the headline is, Family of brain-dead 20-week pregnant mum suing hospital, refusing to turn off her life support until the baby can be born. So this lady in America, um, she was she collapsed in the kitchen. She was brain uh, she she was brain dead um, from the moment, isn't it? From from the moment she collapsed, she actually uh, became unconscious for an hour, and um, and then at the moment she is brain dead. But they're trying to keep the baby alive. They want to see if um, the baby can actually survive its uh, 24 weeks right. or what the effects will happen. But the family are actually quite disturbed about this. They don't they don't believe that you know she should be kept alive. But because the state promotes pro life, um, they want to sustain the baby. It, it, it has um, a lot of, I mean, to sort of draw from the article, we, I mean, it's it's very, you know, from a religious aspect, from a Islamic perspective, it's it's very like we need fatwas about this because, you know... It's we, a it's, very complex it's issue. It's a very complex yeah. issue. And um, where do you go? Because obviously Islamically we need to, if a mother and um, is pregnant, we yeah. have to uh, save the mother, you see what I mean, um, yeah. before the child. But in this case, the mother is brain dead, but do we keep the child alive? And then you don't know what the outcome will will be of the child once it is it does survive will it have special needs will it have any you know any consequences because uh, technically because she lacked oxygen for an hour it might have affected Don't the know child. What effect on the exactly. baby. It's, it's very sad. I mean, you can uh, obviously, as you said, pro-life is, is a good thing, something mm. that Islamically we would support. But yeah. by the same token, you can understand the the heartache that this must be causing for the family. Definitely. So, definitely, you know, subhanallah, yes. lots of things to, to yeah. weigh up there. Yeah, and then it goes on. Well, my next article is from BBC News. Nine Swedish women receive room transplants. This is also a very tricky, icky subject to uh, sort of get, sort of say this is our perspective yeah, on it yeah. um, Islamically um, but the there are nine uh, Swedish women um, they're going to be receiving this uh, transplant it, it these women um, either they were born without a womb or they have womb problems right. um, they actually derive the room from living relatives um, so they're not they haven't actually been deceased so it's it's again like I mean, we were having this discussion before because it's just one of those topics like you need, this is why we would need a fatwa on these issues because when you have medical advance, advancements like such as this, we need to keep up Islamically, are we allowed to do this? Because obviously, you know, this could lead to you, if you have a womb transplant, you can have IVF, you can have a chance of having a baby. Yeah. But is that the right way to go? And then it is a, it's a so tricky one, isn't it? Because obviously, um, you know, uh, Islamically, it's very progressive, but mm. we we don't have as many scholars as we used to, so our ability to look at this issue in detail and provide a ruling on it is sometimes a bit slower than, than we'd like. So Maybe we just do, but it's just they need to step up to sort of the advancements. I mean, I mean, we need to we need scholars who are out there and actually giving fatwa ahead of like us even reading about yeah. it you know because we're living in a society where literally anything can happen and we have to be pretty much prepared for this well absolutely so, I mean, we, you um, know, we were a yeah. thousand years ahead of everybody else in the world so exactly we, need to, we can keep uh, you know maintain this. that inshallah <laughs> inshallah um, and my final article is actually um, in the metro a life wrecked by alcohol at the age of 35 um, this dying mother of four, um, she basically drunk herself to death. Um, you know, she's uh, now suffered like liver problems. Um, she would drink, it says here, at her worst, she drank four, 24 cans of lager and bottle of uh, pear cider in the morning. Um, and, you know, she leaves behind four children. And it's, it's a devastating it is story. A, it is a very devastating story. And it's not, it's not a brilliant, like, you know, picture to see of, like, this woman. She's not... Um, <laughs> There's no hope. I mean, her partner is there next to her, but it's, it, it just goes to show that how people can... Inst she had lots of, like, uh, um, relationship problems, yeah, and this is yeah. what she resorted to. And then maybe, you know, sort of the underlying factor is, is that she could have gone somewhere else, but who knows, not 
Allah knows what the story is behind that one. Yeah, so. that's the sad thing, isn't it? It seems like lots yeah. of things, um, you know, for children, in obviously a relationship now, he's by her side, so it seems like lots of things to live for. It's just a shame yeah. that... Well, you th you expect her to live for her children as well, yeah. so make sure that, you know, they grow up. And, yeah, but there's uh, lots of people, stuff, lots of so. desperate people out there, unfortunately, that are, are kind of... Uh, victims of these very sad circumstances. Yeah, so I would say that my my articles were pretty thought-provoking. But uh, yeah. yeah, hopefully, in Charlotte, get the scholars like saying something about yeah, it. Yeah, no, right? absolutely. Well, great, uh, great way to start the morning. Anyway, lots of interesting articles there for us to think about. So Jazakallah, her sisters. Uh, we've had a dynamic start to the show, but we are off now for a quick break. Don't go anywhere because after the break, we'll be back with her views, where we discuss women's struggles throughout history. Where did it all actually begin, and have these issues been resolved in our modern day times? See you shortly. Assalamu alaikum. Of Ibn Kathir. The competition begins. An exciting new children's book available now. For more details, go to ibnkathir.co.uk. Get your copy now. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. You're tuned in to Women's AM with myself, Liz, and on the panel today we have sisters Nazia and Aisha, and of course our special guest, Sister Tasneem Nazir. Welcome back, ladies. So, Sister Tasneem, uh, it's so nice to have you joining us. Jazakallah here. And um, I understand you're a journalist, you're an author, mother of three, mashallah, very busy lady. So, <laughs> I'm interested to know how do you um, maintain the work? home life balance? Well I think it's important to have kind of like good time management. Um, I mean it's not always possible when you have you know three kids and you're trying, to, imagine, you know, yeah. trying to balance, balance <laughs> it, it all hard. up. It, it is very you know hectic but um, you know what, what helps is kind of having a checklist or... or I'm big on lists myself, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah sch scheduling your time you know effectively so that um, you build up these effective time management to, to handle both work Absolutely. and family Great life. Great top tip there. <laughs> <laughs> what about your current projects? Are you working on anything at the moment? I am. I've currently got um, um, a book out um, with an international Islamic publishing house, and that's um, oh, yeah. a story called Alina Celebrates Eid. That's that's named after oh. my daughter, um, mm -hmm. Alina, and um, it's the first um, Islamic children's book, um, picture book for international Islamic publishing house, mm -hmm. based on um, the festival of Eid. Okay. So it's just nurturing enthusiasm for the festival, and um, sure. you know. Um, also kind of inculcating um, this concept of gratitude towards Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala, which I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. You know? With all your work and your articles, Masha, I'm sure you must have received some awards for it. So, um, have I ha you? I, I, I have received a few awards. I, I, I never really know um, why. It always comes as a surprise. And But mm -hmm. um, I have um, um, received a few during my time, um, uh, such Masha. as the Asian Woman of Achievement and different Masha. types of awards. Um, and it just keeps you motivated and encouraged encourages you, I yeah. think, to oh, carry absolutely. on, yes. carry on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, congratulations for those. And Jazakallah here for telling us a little bit about yourself. Uh, for now, let's go straight on to our next segment with Her Views. When we think of the struggles by women within the last few centuries or so, we immediately recall the struggles for equality by the suffragette movement in the early 20th century and the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s. The truth is, the struggle by women to assert their voices goes far beyond in time. Even up until today, we find that women still do not have the rights, both within Islamic and Western societies. The right to equal pay in the workplace and the political and economic sphere is still to be realised. In today's discussion, we'll be looking at the history of these struggles, their nature, causes, and what is the solution in going forward. Before we go to the sisters on the panel, let's take a quick look at this clip on the matter. Born in Manchester in 1882, Sylvia Pankhurst grew up surrounded by politics and activism. Her mother, Emmeline Pankhurst, was a leading suffragette campaigning for women's right to vote. Her father was also active in the suffrage movement 
and her elder sister Christabel was to become a leading strategist within the Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU. By 1911, Sylvia had begun to influence the political direction of the WSPU. Sylvia set up mother and baby clinics, free healthcare facilities, a cut price restaurant, providing over 400 meals a day, and education for local children. Locals soon began to refer to her as our Sylvia. Many suffragettes had died in the struggle, including Emily Wilding Davidson, who died after stepping in front of King George's horse running in the Epsom Derby as a sign of protest. Others died as a result of force feeding and some from police brutality. Today, Sylvia Pankhurst remains a symbol of working class struggle and an inspiration to women and men worldwide. Certainly uh, an interesting clip there that shows the brutality um, that, that the women often faced in this movement. I think what's really striking is the fact that the, a lot of issues that are mentioned um, that was affecting women back then, they're still today still the case exists. you know yes. obviously from the news bites but yeah. you know it kind of just highlights the point that there's uh, while there is things that have been achieved but this is still a long way to go in terms to of done. women's issues absolutely absolutely uh, just a reminder that this is a live show and we'd love to you to phone in to give us your questions or comments on this issue the number should be appearing on your screen shortly inshallah so please do contribute to our discussion um, sister Tasneem I wanted to come to you first um, when we speak of the struggles uh, by women for women's issues what are we actually talking about well I think there's been a variety of struggles throughout the years and um, yeah. Even in the pre-Islamic uh, period of time, when uh, women basically had um, no rights, and you had like the Arab um, pagan women who, astaghfirullah, had to even bury their children, and obviously this was abolished by the Prophet, um, yeah. uh, peace be upon him. And I mean, other struggles that are quite prevalent were um, rights of education, um, you know, uh, human rights, and um, domestic violence and ra race-related issues, which are still quite prevalent in, in society today unfortunately, unfortunately so yeah. there's just a variety of struggles that women have been campaigning for throughout the years and I think there's more human rights um, advocates which are female that are doing their best to kind of change the status quo now yeah no nowadays. absolutely obviously one that springs to mind we've got Malala who is the um, you know exactly. the girl from Afghanistan who was shot and is now a big campaigner for women's rights particularly um, education exactly um, and she's done very well in um, bringing the raising awareness of the issue and it was quite um, surprising that you know education is still an issue that they you know I think um, it's very important even Islamically that women have the right to be educated definitely no absolutely so when did the struggle um, when did the struggle for women's rights really begin us yeah I mean it's, a, it's difficult to to get the exact point but this much uh, um, you know there are various reasons for this when you look at it the fact of the matter is that when we know women have always struggled over the millennia you look at the stories we know there were issues in terms yeah. of how they were treated but in terms of what their responses were there's very very there's not enough sort of scholarly text on the matter because simply when you look at it history was actually written by men yeah. and when when what was written about it was more about what men's achievements were what they did in terms of society yeah. so they wrote about war about their scholastic achievements and so on and things like that but in terms of women no it, and it's really strange because I've got a quote here like the English novelist Virginia Woolf she said for most part of history anonymous was a woman and this is really strange when you consider she's half of humanity and yeah. there's so little info, information about her in terms of what were her issues affecting her um, later on obviously they they would began to be referenced but it was more in a very derogatory way in terms of how they were as wives mothers daughters you know the roles were very belittled and that's how the status quo was for a while until if you look at it the, the prominent parts in history where they, they where you can actually say there was open struggle where it is documented the first would have been the suffragette movement in the early 19th yeah. century yes. where they were looking for rights such as the right for equal pay and the second kind of marker uh, would have been the the next century in the early half of the 19th century where you had the the events of World War two yes. which and also because of the social classes that were changing this was now 
women were now being encouraged into society and it's really strange they were now being referenced as they're making contribution mm -hmm. whereas before before the fact that they were rearing a whole generation this was never looked at That's as a contribution, no contribution yeah. but this was yeah. and it was so short-lived because obviously you know men came back from war yeah. they would come back and then yeah. obviously they were then pushed back into domestic mm -hmm. life they then felt that same self-worthlessness of where do I fit in within society yeah. Yeah. and then this whole thing came about again if you now flash back to the forward I mean flash forward to the to now although they've overcome a lot of obstacles in terms of workplace yeah. but it's not in any way completely you know there's so many issues so many Absolutely. issues still yeah. Yeah. they're still fighting for the equal pay mm. there's still a lot of discrimination that they face plus the fact that it's their nature they want to have families and these two things they can't reconcile it yeah. so yeah. I think there's a lot of issues there in yeah terms no of absolutely and I think I think it's an important point that you brought of the, um, the domestic life and how yeah. that role is very much uh, belittled because yeah. obviously Islamically um, you know we very much contextualize that role into a very important role within yeah. society mm -hmm. uh, and a celebrated role mm -hmm. whereas uh, you know obviously what we're talking about is, is something different where this role is is made to seem very menial and very yeah. you it's know, almost like they're trying to define some with yeah but it's just not being defined by the right people yeah no it's true and yeah. interesting example there of the um, suffragette movement um, and obviously throughout history we've seen many of these um, mm -hmm. movements some are well known some not so well known of um, women's rights and women's struggles can you give us some more examples um, well yes sister I mean um, one that's not very well known is the national movement of rural uh, women in South Africa who, yeah. and they're advocating human rights for inheritance property and um, they, uh, they live in an area called Zulu and which is uh, quite poverty stricken so yeah. um, they're constantly having this battle um, you know between um, uh, in, in their area that they, they really want to get get their women trained and educated and um, get them to the stage where they can actually um, fun uh, fend for themselves really yeah, and yeah. get out of that kind of um, poverty line so um, they're doing amazing work at the moment they've actually kind of um, they started in the 1900s and now they're um, wow.